on to our next segment. All right, what is analysis and should you do it? Analysis, um, people often talk about, oh, analyze your games or, oh, analyze an opening or stuff like that. But a lot of people don't even understand fundamentally in like a succinct one sentence explanation what game analysis is. Just like I found that a lot of people couldn't tell you correctly in one sentence what the difference between tactics and strategy is. So that's another thing I like to occasionally make sure that everybody knows. Um, analysis. Can anybody here in the chat room give me a slam bang definition of analysis? Any of you feel like you can tell me what analysis is? What is this thing? that you hear about, that you've maybe tried to do a few times. All right. I'll give you my answer now. I see you guys think it's a hard question, but I like to give you some time to, to think on your own. And uh, I think some pauses here and there are definitely helpful in this kind of educational material. So uh, now we've got some answers coming in. Of course, there was, the, there was the lag. Detailed examination of the elements or structure of some position, I assume. Um, learning from your mistakes. Uh, study of the possibilities in a chess position. Very good. Um, and the somewhat tautological response, close analysis, um, seeing your mistakes and seeking to understand why one side gained or didn't gain an advantage. Okay. So we've got some, some excellent questions. Um, you guys are all, you know, partially right or right, depending, and I will now furnish you with my response. To me, analysis is fundamentally a single, a single process. It is the process of trying out different moves. That's it. Analysis is just trying out different moves. So um, let's say you have this position out of an opening. And in the game, white developed the rooks. And you're curious what kind of how the positions are if white plays e5. Some of you may recognize this as a game of Juan Wen Yan's from last week, which I'm using again as an example for what I want to talk about today. So let's say in the game, you know, white developed the rooks and you had an idea of what, of what you thought might happen if they played e5, but e5 was this really important move that white could have played for several moves and didn't. And so what you want to do is you want to understand um, how good or bad was the position if e5 was played? That's your question. You now do analysis. You play out a ton of different moves to try and figure out what would or wouldn't have happened, right? There's an obvious branch between playing knight d5 or trading, right? So you would look at taking and you would also look at knight d5. You just play out a bunch of different moves. And every now and then you reach a point where you kind of evaluate, okay? And analysis, as I say, the basic process of just trying out different moves, it's not super helpful unless you make some evaluations along the way, but I'm kind of assuming that your brain naturally will. As you're looking through a bunch of positions, even if you're not trying to evaluate, your brain as a chess player is constantly telling you which positions you think are good or bad. Um. So someone's wondering if analysis means going over every single move. That is the process that a computer does or used to do. Now I think most computer programs have some like have some pruning algorithms so that they don't actually go through every single move. But um, is analysis going through every single move? And someone else is also asking, should I check all moves? The answer is no. It is impossible to check all moves. And I deliberately said that analysis is the process of checking out different moves. Not all different moves, but different moves. So you just want to try out some moves that weren't played. 
and you just reach some positions, you know, then we try another variation. We go knight d5, cd5, takes, 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 bishop here. And now we try saving our bishop. And then, you know, then black plays this move and we play here. And then, you know, we evaluate some other position, right? So we get to this, right? And then we go back and we try something else. We go here, 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 and then trading once, followed by rook to e1. And then rook c8, I don't know, maybe queen b3, attacking this. This comes here, and this comes here. And again, we evaluate something, right? Um, e5, we've got our other branch. The knight could come to e5, right? Bishop could come here, knight c6. Oops, we say, right? You evaluate that one quickly, and then you try some other move. Right, just playing out a bunch of moves. And you do this a bunch of time with a bunch of different moves. Okay, that is what analysis is. It's just trying all these different moves and then making some evaluations, drawing some lessons from the positions that you see. In general, for all of us, there will be positions where we don't know what the best move was or we don't know how good or bad the position was. In either case, when we try out a bunch of different moves, we gradually start to see, oh, this position was good for white or oh, Rook to d1 was better than e5. We might be wrong about that, but we're gradually, as we put together variations, starting to figure that out. So um, we have another question here. How deep should analysis go? We will get to that in a moment. We're going to talk about then how to analyze and should you do it, how much should you do it, etc. So anyone have any questions about that very basic process? It's looking at different moves and evaluating. And now we'll talk about what you can or can't do with it. I would definitely be doing this yourself with your own brain, not with your computer. Um, oh, but once you've done it yourself, would I then look at computer suggestions to check whether or not, I see your question, yeah, what, would I then check with a computer to see how accurate or inaccurate your lines were? Possibly, really only if you're like, really only if you're like a master level. Below that, I just think it's better not to touch the computer. Um, Cause you're not gonna be able to interpret the variations it gives you. So I've said that before, I'm not gonna go into length about computers every single day, but uh, my simple answer to you is yes, I would not check um, anything really with the computer. I would just do this on my own. All right, so to talk about how you should analyze and whether you should analyze, let's discuss what the point of analysis might be. What's the point of analysis? I mean, we set out, for example, in this position to try and figure out how good or bad the position was after E5. So is the point of analysis to find the right answer, to find out whether E5 is good for white or black? My answer would be no. That is not actually the, the point of looking at E5. E5 is simply an interesting question to you, and it's a reason for you to start doing some analysis. But the answer is actually not that important. If you just wanted to know what the evaluation was after E5, as many of you would be quick to point out, you could have figured that out more quickly by simply putting the position into a computer and asking the computer, and the computer would tell you the evaluation after E5, and then you could try to remember that and apply it at some point. Um, so the idea of, of, an, of analysis here is not to find the answer to your question necessarily of whether E5 is good or bad for you um, in this position. The purpose of analysis is really to practice your ability to analyze. Yeah, that's really, I think, I think the point of it. And that goes along with why I would say 
that you know using the computer is not helping you because using the computer is not developing your ability to analyze and you're not necessarily trying to find the answer. Now one of the main reasons it's not important um, one of the main reasons it's not important for you to try and like exhaustively find the answer by playing e5 is you're also not likely to find the right answer through your analysis. Okay, um, you know if you are if you are not a GM, the odds of finding the right answer through an analysis session is not like super super high on any really complicated questions, right? When you're doing analysis variations, there are mistakes in your variations and there are mistakes in your evaluations down down the line of your variations. Mistakes in your evaluation of the positions that you reach. So your odds of finding the right answer are not super high. The point of doing it is really just to train your ability to look at chess scientifically and to analyze. That's really the point, in my opinion. So from there, let's, let's answer the question of whether or not you should analyze. Should 1,000 rated players analyze? Should 1,500 rated players analyze? Should 2,000 rated players analyze? Well, first of all, if you find it entertaining, my answer is definitely so. It will make you it will make you better at chess, and you'll be entertained as you do it. If you don't find it entertaining, if you don't like analysis, then I wouldn't push yourself too hard to do it just because it could teach you something. Because if you don't enjoy it, it's gonna decrease your enjoyment and excitement of chess in general, which is gonna hurt you more than what you learn by doing it. I would say you should give it a, a couple tries if you haven't done it before because you may find that it's really you may find that it's really interesting and fun. Um so it can be it's definitely worth giving it a try and see if once you do it two or three times you then enjoy it. Um sorry I'm struggling a little bit to keep up with all the excellent but long questions at the same time as presenting things that I'd that I had sort of like thought of in advance that I wanted to tell you guys. Um, I'm going to take uh, a second to look through questions in a moment, but let me finish this. I'll say that a player at any of those levels from 1,000 to 2,000 on up through Masters um, can learn some things by analyzing. They may not learn like exactly the right answer every time. They may often learn the wrong answer. Like you might analyze E5 for like 10 hours and come up with the conclusion that e5 was really strong and should have been played and wasn't played and you might be totally wrong and it was better for white to play rook d1 and rook e1 okay but that incorrect knowledge will have tons of little sub knowledges right of things that you figured out in various variations and some of those will be right and most of all all of those little things that you learned will have been priming you to one day eventually understand correctly whether or not e5 is good or bad and have it as your own knowledge, as we've talked about before when we talked about studying openings, for example. That knowledge that you have worked to achieve is really your own knowledge and sticks with you in a different way than um, a piece of information that a computer tells you that E5 is minus 0.1. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a useless approach to this position. Hard to remember. You don't know why. You didn't work for it. It'll slip your mind later. You won't remember if it was in positions with a light squared bishop or a knight on D7 or whatnot. Uh, which will change it okay but in general this will be useful to anyone and if you enjoy doing it all i strongly recommend that you start doing it at all of those levels uh, now i'm going to take a quick break to look through some of the questions and answer some good ones and then i will tell you about how to do your analysis specifically so um All right, one question is, don't you require something or someone to help you indicate where a key moment is so then you can work on that moment? That is a good question. Um, it could be helpful, but one interesting thing that you might even be trying to do is just trying to identify what the critical moment was. That could be the kind of thing you're trying to figure out. So you might have a game like, um, like this one here that I've picked as an example, and you've got this whole series of moves, and you don't know when the critical moment in the game came. Right? Blom, 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 blom. Suddenly, white's attacking on the king side. Then, black wins a rook, and white resigns. So, part of what you need to do might be just to look to look through a game like this and try and figure out what a critical moment is. So, that could be one answer to your question, is that your study might actually be just trying to pinpoint critical moments could actually be the useful thing rather than having someone else tell you where the critical moment is. 
And my second answer to you is, um, even if you're wrong about what the critical moment is, pick the moment that you think is critical and look at that moment and analyze it. So supply that for yourself. Don't have someone else supply it for you. If you find out that it's not the critical moment, like if you think the critical moment is like, oh, here he should have played king g1 instead of bishop c4, and then you start analyzing king g1 and you find that it loses just as bad as king f1 did, then what you've learned is that you were wrong about the critical moment. And that's a perfectly good lesson. Nothing wrong with that being your lesson for the day and with having spent your analysis time figuring that out. Absolutely nothing wrong. So I think you do not need someone else telling you what is a critical moment. Now, I mean, I am I can offer you guys some good examples of like, here's a good thing for like a 1200 to try and solve. Here's a good thing for a 1600 to try and solve. And that can be helpful. I'm not saying it's like bad to have like advice or have something handed to you. But what I'm saying is that even without that, there's no reason you can't do useful, fruitful work on your own. Next question. If I feel uncomfortable in a position or it is exhausting to find a move, I analyze it by trying out some moves, then do a blunder check with an engine. Right, okay. So you're, you're picking on purpose a position that you're uncomfortable in or that you find difficult to analyze. That is a good way to choose a position to look at. You're picking something that's like a bit difficult for you and where you know there's something that you don't understand. And then by trying out some moves, there's a chance that you will then understand the position better and be able to handle it better. Um, and then I do a blunder check with an engine. Sure. If you're just looking for when the engine says plus three, minus three compared to some move, I mean, I can't ban you from doing it, but it's I really don't think it helps you. I don't, I don't see the value in that. I think it's pretty much pointless. Um, so yeah, I mean, the engine will tell you that in some variation you missed like a tactic and then you have to change a move and then what you you restart your analysis using the move that isn't a blunder but how do you then not start looking at whatever the computer's first choice is and just playing out those moves without understanding them i don't know i don't really see the value of that i would like assume that you've got when you do an analysis i would assume that you've got some blunders in it but that over if you've looked at a hundred variations and like 90 of them were good for white Assume that your blunders partially cancel out at the, and that the position was good for white, even though in some cases you missed a better move for white and in some cases you missed a better move for black. And sometimes there will be a key blunder that actually changes the evaluation of things on an early move and you just didn't find it. And that's fine too. Then you've learned something wrong, but you've like you've done the work yourself. Your brain was engaged the whole time. And then later you um, you may learn the truth about it. All right. As a follow-up to the previous comment, I don't think the issue is finding the with is with finding the right answer. I think the issue would be figuring out what the question even is. So how do you figure that out? All right. So how do you figure out the key moment? Yeah, I think um, I think that is a a good question, which I think I've already partly addressed, which is you may not be able to identify the key moment, and that is a good thing that you can try to work on if that is a weakness of yours, and that is in itself a separate topic that we'll talk about at another time um, in my stream, sort of like figuring out key moments and how do you know what, what a key moment is. But since you've asked right now and you might not be there then, I'll give you one brief indication, which is a critical moment is often when an irreversible decision is made, such as deciding to open the game versus close it. Um, deciding to start a pawn storm on the king side when you're both castled king side is really going to change the direction of the game. Making a sacrifice, um, making an important positional exchange, anything that you that carries this kind of weight that you can't go back and it could really change the balance of the position. It introduces new significant imbalances, either in your favor or in your opponent's favor. You don't necessarily know, um, but those tend to be critical moments and then the other thing that tends to be critical moments are tactical moments you know can often decide a game so that could be another thing to look at is you can go to the point where you know black plays bishop f2 check as like okay this is critical why did black play bishop f2 and and does it work or not right or similarly when white plays knight g4 h5 you see an introduction of like a new level of of tactics going on here and then you know sacrifices so this could stand out to you as like a moment worth going back and investigating 
Another question, should you analyze master games or your own games? Either. They can both be fruitful. Um, in general, you'll learn more about yourself from analyzing your own games, which has its advantage. And you'll learn more about good chess by analyzing master games. No offense. So um, that has its own advantages as well, right? If you analyze, even without analyzing, if you're just playing through games by like Lasker, Capablanca, Aljechin, Botvinnik, like you're going to be learning things, like you're just going to be seeing good moves. And by osmosis, you become better, right? Because you're just seeing good moves played again and again and again. Um, so if you analyze those games... You'll be seeing a lot of good moves and you'll be gradually understanding like the underpinnings of those good moves. Why did they work? And, you know, what was what were the strengths or weaknesses of the positions that these good players were making? So something to learn from either, right? All right. Another question. When doing analysis, what is a way to improve your evaluation of positions while analyzing? Yeah, basically, um, a very important part of analysis is like the calculating, and another important part is the evaluating. And you might be better, much better or worse at one or the other. Um, to get better at evaluating, one thing is to understand when you're confident in your evaluation and when you're un and when you're not confident. And in general, let's assume that when you're not confident, it's because accurately. You're, you're less likely to be right, okay? So you've got some position and you really, you know, you're playing this opening for the first time and you really don't know what the evaluation is. If you're really less confident about the evaluation, that's when you want to sort of have your tentative evaluation but then try out more different moves. The more different moves you try out and the further you go, you'll eventually be reaching positions that are easier for you to evaluate. When you evaluate those, you cast that evaluation backwards to the position you started from, right? So let's say I didn't know the evaluation of this position here. Then I tried all these different lines with E5, right? And one position ended like this. 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 As I evaluate those positions, I can use that information to come back and evaluate this position more accurately. And so basically... Yeah, that's the example that should hopefully clarify the abstract way I explained it to you first. Positions where you're not confident in your valuation, you try out more and more moves. And then those moves hopefully eventually lead you to a more correct evaluation of your first evaluation. And this is also one of the big things that like, actually a lower rate of player has to try more different moves than a higher rate of player, right? So you might think like, oh, Carlson calculates, you know, 10,000 moves in the time that I calculate three. But... When Carlson analyzes a game, he's only going to have to try out three or four moves before he realizes, oh, the evaluation is this. Whereas you are going to have to try out 5,000 moves before you start to realize, oh, this is the evaluation. So the better you are at evaluating, the less moves you need to try out. The worse you are at evaluating, the more moves you need to try out, which is why analysis is super exhausting for weaker players, and they need to take a very small scope to their analysis, which we'll be talking about in a moment. I'm going to scroll down, see if there's any other questions here I really need to address. You guys can tell I'm quite a, quite a bit behind in those questions because I was trying to get because I thought they were good questions and I was giving thorough answers. So sorry if I'm not getting to your um, to your questions. Um, should I study numerous openings or study chess basics and let that guide me? Should I study numerous openings or study chess basics and let that guide me? Um, I prefer to study numerous openings once you reach like once you reach like a 12, 1400, uh, up to your taste, 1200, 1400, 1600 level, start studying lots of different openings. There is a phase early on where maybe just getting some basics could be fine. Um, you know, when you're like under a thousand. But then at some point, I think it becomes good to broaden your horizon and, and start learning some stuff about lots of different positions. That said, it's very exhaustive to try and learn about a position. So I understand that if you just scratch the surface on a bunch of positions, it may not feel like you're ever acquiring any real knowledge. And so what you might want to do is take one 
kind of opening and study that for like you know two months three months while playing it and then over the next two or three months play a different opening and study that opening at the same time all right so I hope I've answered some of those questions to satisfaction and I thank everyone for the good questions because I think that when you ask good questions like that and I provide whatever answers to them um, it uh, it uh, you know improves the value of these of these videos immensely you know provides provides useful information that other people would also be wondering all right so now let's talk about what to analyze okay here the critical thing to realize is your limitations okay at whatever level you are you are stronger or weaker at calculating and evaluating and you need to take on a task that's at like a proper level for you so that it's not dispiriting exhausting and eternal without ever reaching an answer okay so for example this game that Juan Wen Yan played it's a super interesting game you know and Juan Wen Yan is obviously like a pretty good player like pretty pretty close to master level I would guess I don't remember maybe like maybe 2000 maybe 2200 I mean he's good so this game is definitely at an appropriate level for him to analyze and you know a very interesting game and since he is at like a 2000 2200 ish level he is strong enough to try and analyze his game in its entirety and try to understand all the critical moments of the game and all the major mistakes that he made and what would be improvements on those mistakes. But let's assume that some of my viewers are rated a thousand. If I asked you to try and analyze a game of this complexity fully, understand the evaluation at every point in the game, understand every mistake that was made and what were the good decisions and what should have been done instead. I mean, I'm assuming that even if I gave you an entire like year it would basically be impossible without you just generally getting way better over the course of that year and eventually being able to do it okay good so we do have 1000s in the room excellent so for you that kind of question would be inappropriate and it would be difficult and you'd be going back and forth between you know 50 different questions and you'd be having trouble evaluating all the different positions and it would be really disorienting and that's not a good assignment okay All right, so, sorry, just checking some questions. I'm going to save them for later, the, the new questions I'm seeing. <clears throat> All right, so you need to pose yourself something that's like a more reasonable question. So um, one option is to take a single position and ask yourself what the best move is in a single position and see if you can figure that out, right? So you could take a position, like a critical position here after bishop takes f2 check, right? And you could try and analyze this this position here without, without anything more from white's perspective, okay? So you can try and analyze here, you know, should you take this? What other options do you have? How good or bad is it if you take it and black plays rook to a2? So you can narrow your scope to a single move in a game or a single position, right? It doesn't even have to be from a game. You can just set up a position and try and f figure something out about it, okay? So that's the first thing you can do. If you're around like, I would say people only really start doing any analysis somewhere around like 1,000 to 1,200. So I'm gonna start with them. If you're about 1,000 to 1,200, I would say you would wanna either basically just look at a single position, single move kind of question in general and try and and try and try and work that out okay so um you know you try out a bunch of different moves you might want to i mean if you're working with like a chess board and a piece of paper you would want to like write out some of those um variations i've got some old school friends who say that's the way to do it a lot of people a lot of other people um use like pgns and computers at this point right so basically it's saving all the variations for you and like all these variations here we can we can click through quickly so you could make a branch of variations that you could see on the side hang on i'll show you an example 
real fast. I mean, I think you guys probably all get it, but in any case, you know, over on the side, you've got something like this, right? And, you know, you can build out a branch of variations with like, you know, king h2, bishop here, rook h3, bishop d2, queen h5, bishop h6, and then, you know, bishop d2, queen takes d2, rook b4, or sorry. Then after rook b4, we suddenly realize, wait a minute, we could take this. And then, you know, we try and analyze this position. Then you try just one different move here. Ooh, did you find a draw? Right? Oh, yeah, that's definitely a threat, etc. right? So you see we're like building over here. Don't worry about those moves. I played them like super fast and they were probably nonsense. But I was just trying to build up like a series of variations here, right? You build up these variations and over time you kind of like organize them and figure out which ones were good or bad. Um, and eventually maybe come to a conclusion about how good or bad this bishop f2, king f2 move was. Okay. All right. So that, so that um, could be a good exercise for a 1,000 to 1,200 player. And, you know, honestly, it could take one or two hours of, of work easily to try and figure out that position. That one's a little bit complicated. I would also often try and pick like a slightly simpler position than that um, to do my analysis with. Now, <clears throat> Now for players rated between 1200 and 1600, I've got two different kinds of uh, exercise of analysis for you that I could suggest, okay? One of them is to take a complete game of yours, such as this game, and just try and find one mistake in it, okay? So in this, in this example, or in this exercise, you're not being told where the critical moment is, uh, you're kind of scanning through the game trying to find one error. I found that that's like a pretty good exercise for a player rated 1,300, 1,500, 1,600. Um, because you, you'll basically have a sense like there's like, oh, there will be like three or four possibilities that kind of pop into your head when I first ask you that question. You're like, well, it could have been, it could have been when I traded. It could have been when I played H5. It could have been, right? You have a few possibilities that pop up. And so you can kind of like start to look at each of them a little bit casually till you start to get an instinct like, oh, I think this one might really be a mistake. Let me try and like look at it harder. Now, here's a very important thing for you all to understand. For a move to be a mistake, there must be a better move that can be made. Okay, so if you have some position, I'm going to load a new game for you now. Okay, so if you have some position like this, and when you play fg5, white checkmates you, and when you play, you know, bishop e6, white also takes it. If you don't have any good move in this position, then f takes g5, even though it allows mate in one, wouldn't really be truly considered a mistake if every move you have just loses horribly exactly the same, okay? Or imagine for a second that, you know, um, that you're down two rooks and a queen and you have this position, okay? Imagine this is your position here, okay? Would you call f takes g5 a mistake because it allows queen f7? I wouldn't really. I would say, huh, this doesn't seem to be working. Okay, I would say that fg5 doesn't really count as a mistake if you're so hopelessly lost that every single move loses equally badly. 
okay? So for a move to be a mistake, to prove that you found a mistake, the thing that you have to do is not just find that that move leads to a bad position in some way, but you need to compare it to another move and show that that other move leads to a better situation, okay? Um, so that is what you're doing when you're looking for a mistake. You're looking for a move that seems bad, but then you need to hone in on that move, see that's bad by finding a move that's better than it and showing that that better move was better than the bad move. That's, that's the exercise for you know, 12 to 1600 that I'm kind of suggesting. Find one move that you can find one improvement on is another way of seeing it, right? Find one improvement on the play in the game. All right, any important questions here? Looks like not really, not really. Um, all right, so here is, here is the other exercise that I like to suggest for, um, for players of this level. I like to suggest that you take an extremely short game. So here's a short game for you as an example. Check this out. I don't just mean a miniature. I don't just mean a 20 move game. Right? Eight move game. Right? Checkmate and eight moves. Take a super game. Not just a miniature, but a mini miniature. Take something super short like that and try to find try to find the losing move. Now I, I think this, from my experience, this is like still a super, super difficult task for someone rated like 1200. But once you're up like 1500, 1400, 1500, 1600, this starts to become uh starts to become at like the right level and starts to become doable. Um a very, very super short game, and then you try and basically prove where the losing move occurred. Now, there might be more than one bad move in the game, but you're trying to find out which one is the losing move, right? So, for example, in this position, you might think that F6 is not the best move, okay? You might think it's a bad move, but you might think that in this position, if black didn't allow maiden one, he could have still won the game by just playing bishop to d7 and playing on down a piece. Well, probably not. You'd be wrong if that was your opinion, right? But that might be what you think. So then you would try to sort of like show that or prove that, right? And then you would say the losing move was pawn takes knight, not f6. Okay? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at a game that's sh super short. There's a good chance there's more than one mistake, but you're trying to figure out which move pushes the losing player over the over the edge of the cliff, right? After that move, there was no coming back. They could have started suddenly playing like Kasparov instead of a 1,000 player, but the position was lost. That's what you want to look for, okay? So that is um, that is a puzzle that I offer to you guys. Um, for any of you in the viewership who are like 1,300 to 1,600-ish level, I offer you this PGN. Right? Uh, see if you can figure out what the losing move was in this game. And you know, you can report back to me by message or whatever later. Uh, there's no way you're gonna answer it like in the middle of this show. So this is this is a possible homework assignment for those of you who fall within that within that group. Try and find um, try and find what move you think is the losing move for black and explain it and why. Alright? Um we have another game pasted into chat that I think might also serve our purposes. So I'm going to copy and paste it um, here as a user contribution. Let's see this one. If this is a good example of a game you could use, symmetrical English. Bishop f4, e5 here, check, and white resigned. Excellent example. Excellent, excellent example. Thank you. Um, so this would be another example of the kind of game that I would look for, pick out, and take on as an exercise if I were 1300, 1400, 1600, something like that. Give that a try. See if you can find like for sure which move is white's losing move. Okay.
at any point in that game, any move which you think is the losing move, the move after which the game could no longer be saved. Okay? Um, any questions on that? So it's, you're picking one out of the six moves in this game that white played that was losing in the other game, one out of the seven moves black played, which was the losing move. Yeah. And sometimes you can narrow it down a little bit because like in this game, for example, was D4 the losing move for white? Well, obviously not. We know full well that D4 doesn't lose, right? Is C4 the losing move? Again, super opening theory, you know, Every GM in the world ever has played this move at some point, so we know that's not losing, right? So you can narrow it down from six moves down to four, just like that, right? Because there were two moves that you know are perfectly good opening theory, and ideally you can justify why those are good moves, you know, what the purpose of them was, you know, gaining space, making squares for your pieces in the center, opening up your bishop and queen, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's the exercise for you guys. Now let's keep moving up a little bit. We'll talk for a few minutes about players over 1600, what they can start working on. So once you're over 1600, you can start trying, you can start getting closer to analyzing a full game. Understand if you try and analyze a full game of full length that there will be a lot of mistakes um, in your analysis and that it would be difficult. So I wouldn't hold yourself to a high standard if you do that. If you're over 16, if you're, let's say 1600 to 1800 or 1900, um, the way I would analyze is like one of two ways. Number one, pick miniatures. So pick like, pick like 15 to 20 move games instead of these mini six to eight move games. Pick like 15 to 20 move games and try and analyze the whole game on a 15 to 20 mover. Okay. That's one exercise that, um, that you can do. Not just picking out the losing move, but kind of like giving a full presentation of the whole game, right? Um, so on a game 15 to 20 moves if you're going to analyze like longer games from your own games or longer master games then I would kind of do the pick a couple moments approach similar to where I said like a lower rated player should try and find one mistake in the game if you're like 1600 to 1900 and you're analyzing your whole game maybe just try and pick like try first to pick out what you think a couple of the key critical moments are and then just analyze those critical moments and don't cover every single move of the game okay so you can do sort of spot analysis of a full game of yours picking out some key moments um and then for like 1900 and up i would say you should be able to do just like full game analyses there will be some errors in your analysis but you can look at complete games of yours or complete games of masters and just just try and figure everything out about those games, you know, try and like fully understand them and then turn it into this kind of like presentation of what, of what the game is. Like what you saw Laurent provide us on the last, um, on the last year games analyzed. Um, he had a game of his with like full notes about like every move that he thought he made a mistake and what he was going for and what he realizes he was wrong about or what he's still wondering about. That's the kind of thing that you want to do. I assume that that took Laurent like, probably like five hours or something like that. Let me think. Probably three to five hours, I would guess. Um, let me see. I'm gonna show this to you guys real quick to show you what it should look like, okay? So, I'm gonna do another new screen share real quick, show you my show you what his analysis looked like. This is the PGN he shared with us the other day. I know it's covering over my thing for a moment, but we're only going to be on this for a moment. And look, you can scroll down and you see he's got variations. He's got comments about what he was, what he was doing or thinking like this, right? A full game presentation, game agreed drawn. So I think you want to, I think you want to start trying to do that if you're in the 1900 to 2200 range. Just full-on game analysis. There will be some mistakes in it, but you can really go through a full game like that. Okay? All right, and that is...
that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions about about uh, analysis, how to do it, what to do with it? I see there's a couple other off-topic questions. There was a question about which master games to look at if you analyze master games, right? Should you start with older games where the play might be more principled? Um, and my answer on that one is that there's definitely a, a, a nice progression if you study starting with uh, early masters and then slowly wake, make your way through history. It's something that we will be doing on this stream in the future. We'll start with... Um, La Bourdonnais McDonald match, and then you know look at Morphe and Steinitz and 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 beyond. Um, that can be like a good way to study master games, but there's nothing wrong with studying current master games. Um, they're less often going to be like one-way streets because nowadays GMs are playing against other GMs equipped with tons of ideas who fight back, and like the games are never that easy because the opposition's never that weak. And when both players play well, it can be harder for a weak player to pick out what the guiding principles are because there's so much back and forth. It's not obvious like what was the winning idea or who was right or wrong in their opening setup. So it could, in many cases, be a little bit easier for you to look at games between one good player and one bad player. I often refer to those as kind of like teaching games. So if you look at a game between Morphe and pretty much like anyone at that age, then basically you're looking at a game from like you know, a 2000 rated player against like a 1200 rated player. And it's very, it's very clear the difference and you can see what ideas Morphe knew. Um, if, if you look at a game between like Emmanuel Lasker and some other player, then you're looking at a game between like, you know, a 2450 player and a 2250 player. And now they're masters, but there's a significant difference in their strengths and you can, and you can, you know, sort of more clearly discern what ideas Lasker was using to beat them. All right. Um, in terms of the question, how often should one practice this kind of analysis? Whenever you feel like it, you know, as much as your appetite is for it, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, just remember to keep it at the right level for yourself so it's not like dispiriting. Like ask yourself questions that you're good enough to have a chance at answering. You know, don't ask yourself to like correctly analyze an 80 move end game between Kasparov and Karpov if you're rated like 1200 and every single move makes you go, huh, why, what? You're not going to figure the whole thing out, right? So pick something at the right level. Um, but that said, you know, as much as you want to, as you're having fun doing it, and as you want to do it, this is a very fruitful way to improve your chess abilities. Not necessarily because of what you're learning from those games, although as you get higher rated, it eventually is. That is how you're learning new materials through the analysis. But when you're like 1,000, 1,200, 1,400, your analysis is wrong, and that's not really where you're learning chess ideas from that much. But you're you're practicing making evaluations, you're practicing trying out variations, you're practicing calculating, and all of that stuff is making you better and you're getting better at those things as you, as you exercise them. Okay, 